Hey, just a reminder here at the, at the start, problem set two is due on Wednesday. So do problem set two. Uh, between then and now, now and then, uh, I'm office hours this afternoon and Wednesday morning. So today's topic is bumper cars, and it's the last of the of the topics, sort of the introduction to, to general, general mechanical physics, after which we'll move off into electricity and magnetism. Uh, bumper cars are, I mean, why, why bumper cars? Because it's a beautiful example of, of the three conserved quantities of physics in action. And we've seen one already at some length, that energy, that energy moves from thing to thing, it's passed along mechanically by doing work, and it'll, it, it, it's in bumper cars too. But there are two other conserved quantities that really play a, an important role in bumper cars, and so it's, you know, it's one of my, a topic I like. Uh, hopefully you've all had some experience with bumper cars. They, they're still around, so they're still at the amusement parks to, to go play with. Um, just to, before even I get very far into this, to remind you, uh, with bumper cars, you, you, you get in this, this, this car with a rubber, in fact, a rubber bumper around it, for reasons that we'll talk about. And everybody else gets in their cars, you pull your feet off the floor, you, you start pressing a pedal, you know, they say go, and you press a pedal, and there's, electri there's electric power available to the car. It actually comes through the floor and through a, an overhead mesh. That's, that's, the car reaches up with a, with a wand and touches that mesh. We'll talk in the not too distant future about how, how electric power, uh, basically how it works, it involves electric circuits and, and having electric charge move from one place to another and pass off the energy in the process. And I don't want to go off on this too, too, at any great length, but, but you have those two electrical contacts, the floor and the ceiling, basically. Uh, electricity is flowing through the car from one to the other and the car receives energy from, from that passage of electric charge. This is off in our future, so, so don't worry about the details at this point. The, the issue is, though, that, that energy really is being delivered electrically to the car. And what does it do? It makes the car start to move forward. How do you manage to get the car to move forward? Well, with the help of a motor, there's a wheel, or, or more than one wheel, in the, in the bumper car that begins to to turn, it's a powered wheel. Remember powered wheels that was last time? The, as that wheel begins to turn against the floor, the floor and the wheel exert forces on one another, frictional forces, of course, and the floor ends up pushing the car forward. It's, it's the, the, the two surfaces are trying not to skid. To a large extent, they don't, but the force that the floor exerts on the wheel as part of this don't skid effect propels the car forward. And Work is being done on the car. It's a little complicated how the, how the, you know, what does the work? Well, as that wheel is turning, it's, there's sort of multiple parts in the story, and ultimately, the axle of the, of the wheel is pushed forward as it moves forward. Uh, that power is coming out of the motor. I'm making this longer story than necessary, perhaps. But anyway, the car begins to, to accumulate kinetic energy. It's going faster and faster. They don't want you to go very fast for reasons having to do with the collisions. Um, the speed, it's not the speed that's the problem, it's, it's the impacts that are the problem. But they get you going. Anyway, so electric power delivers energy to the car. The car then uses it to make kinetic energy and off you go. And that's most of what I'm going to say about energy in bumper cars. It's, it's all there. You can watch it move from car to car. They do do work on each other and all that stuff. Uh, but we've done that. So I want to kind of leave it. Instead, I want to go on to the other conserved quantities. And so that's where we'll head. Is, questions about the, the accumulation of energy in the car? You know, where it comes from? You're not making it out of nothing. It's coming in, it's coming in by way of the power. So my question, which it seems like completely off topic, is if you pull yourself to the center of a spinning playground merry-go-round, and this, by this I mean a, one of these uh, horizontal disks, probably with handles on it and stuff, where a couple kids pile on, one kid stays off and pushes this thing around in a circle, it goes faster and faster. 
Uh, they do still exist. I know of one in Charlottesville, but they're, they're rare, but they're still around. Hopefully you've all played on one. So the question is, you know, you're by yourself on this, on this merry-go-round. Someone has got it spinning and you're, you're, you're going around happily in a circle. And if you pull yourself to the center of that spinning disc, which you do, you grab the handles and you work your way to the center, what happens to its rotation? Any questions on the question? How many think that it will spin faster as you go to the center? How about it'll go slower? How about it'll spin at the same rate? Okay, the vast majority of you are going for it'll spin faster. And that is the case. As you go to the center, uh, inter interestingly, it does require that you pull yourself toward the center. It is not easy to get to the center. You, and it's an, it's an inertial problem. You're trying to go, uh, anyway. you, as you pull yourself to the center, the, the story is you shrink the rotational mass of the entire structure. Remember mo rotational mass? How hard it is to make something undergo angular acceleration with this stick having a smaller angular mass than this stick, rotational mass. This one's hard to, to undergo angular acceleration. This one's easier. When you pull yourself to the center, you shrink the rotational mass of the, of the merry-go-round. And oddly, as we'll see and, and do, do properly in the near future, you know, tens of minutes from now, shrinking your rotational mass has the consequence of increasing your angular velocity. And how did your angular velocity change? Ah, doesn't that violate? I mean, nobody's twisting the merry-go-round, right? You're just part of it. You're part of the system. And doesn't the first law of rotational, uh, Newton's first law of rotational motion, doesn't that like forbid changes in angular velocity? Uh, no, it doesn't because it had two, remember I, it had two words, I call them waffle words from long in my history. They're, they're words that they're added to Newton's first law of rotational motion to exclude certain cases that are messy. The two words were rigid, a rigid object that is free of external torques. A rigid object that's not wobbling. Those are the two, the, that's both of the, the waffles. Um, turns at constant angular velocity. If you're on that merry-go-round and you're climbing toward the center, that merry-go-round and you are not rigid anymore. You're changing the shape of the thing. And that, Newton's first law of rotation motion says, nope, I don't apply to that story. And you do spin faster. And it's, it's apropos of the Olympics coming up. It's the old skater trick. The skater spins with her arms out. And as she pulls into a tight tuck, she spins faster. And we'll do that, OK? So that's in our, that's in our near future. So some observations about bumper cars. The moving cars tend to stay moving. We've already seen that, and we've called it inertia. But we're going to get, we're going we're to find, you know, look under the hood. Why is there inertia? Well, I, I, I've foreshadowed it a week or two ago. We'll look at it more carefully. Um, changes in a car's motion, uh, it, its velocity, its rotation, everything, take some time. You don't, you don't change them instantly, no matter how hard you try. And that's not a big surprise, even with the physics we've already covered. It uh, takes time for, for velocities and angular velocities to change because they involve accelerations driven by forces or torques. Um, the impacts alter velocities and angular velocities. So the imp a lot of what, what I want to look at today is, is, is the, 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 the process of the impact and its consequences. And as we'll see, they exchange these conserved quantities in interesting ways. What else? Oh, things like... The fullest cars are the, higher, are the hardest to redirect. That is, if there are a whole bunch of people playing bumper car, and you got one little kid in a car, and, and a couple of really big people in a, in a second car. So you got, the cars are dramatically different in mass for, to begin with. The impacts are really uneven. The little kid does all the, the changing of motion. The big behemoths in the, in the, in the car uh, not much happens. So bumper car is a lot more exciting if you're the, if you're the smallest hammer on, the, on the, uh, the rink. And, okay, that's a, enough background. Hopefully these are all sort of familiar from experience. Uh, okay, so my, my five questions to go through. And we'll start with, 
does a moving bumper car carry a force? And, I mean, here's this. Here's, on, on day one of this class, I asked whether people could distinguish three, physical, three pairs of physical quantities. And one of them was momentum and force. And there is a sort of an intuitive compulsion to say that, that, that something is moving with, you know, a big thing that's moving fast is carrying with it a lot of force. This happens, you hear this all the time, or I hear this all the time, maybe you're oblivious to it, but, I, but, but, but be aware of it now. L listen for this. That's, that's, that something was coming in with tremendous force and it hit that. Well, no, it wasn't carrying force. You don't carry force with you at all. Force is something that you exert on something else. So if you're by yourself and touching nothing, I mean, neglecting stuff like gravity, which reaches across empty space, but apart from those kind of long distance forces, when you're by yourself, you're by yourself. There's no force at all. So if you're, if you're just roller skating, a skater whizzing across to the right, neglecting the gravity, which is, we now know gravity was there, but, but the skater experiences a support force on, this, on the ice, and therefore doesn't, uh, has zero net force. It's all canceled. So the skater is, is zooming along, carrying no force at all. And there's no force. It's, they're moving because of inertia. Um, so that no force. Got, you got the idea that, there, that you don't carry force with you? Questions about that? You exert it on things, not with, you don't carry. Uh, you will use forces to, to, at the end and the beginning of your journey, but, but not while you're en route. What you carry with you is different. What you carry with you is a conserved physical quantity called momentum. And as with energy, conserved means it's a fixed amount distributed among the whole, everything involved in the story. And you can't change that amount. What, it, what, what is, is. It can move around, like money, my, my usual analogy, but you can't create it or destroy it. So if you've got momentum, you have to carry it with you. You, you can't get rid of it without giving it to something else. And so far, momentum and, and energy are very similar in that respect, but there are some big differences. And one of the biggest differences is that momentum has a direction. It is a vector quantity, right? Vector meaning that you've got an amount and a direction. Energy is not. Momentum is. Momentum to the right is totally, you know, different than momentum to the left. You can have 10 units of momentum to the right, and you have 10 units of momentum to the left, and those are very different. In fact, to, to get, to, to change from 10 units to the right to 10 units to the left, I had to first give away all 10 units, 10 of my, all 10 units to the right, I had to give it away. I actually gave it to the floor. I'll do better in a minute. I gave away 10 units. I got zero left. And now I have to get 10 units in the other direction. So it's a complete change in my momentum. And to, to, to go even a little further than that, uh, to, to deal with a question I actually answered and got involved in talking about momentum two weeks ago or something. When I give away all my momentum to the right, I go to zero. And if I keep giving momentum to the right, to the floor, I end up with a deficit of rightward momentum, which is the same as negative. It's negative rightward momentum, which is positive leftward momentum. The, the, the vector flips, direction flips as it goes from a negative amount to, to the right is, is equal to a positive amount to the left. So, um, so that's the story. To illustrate this better, I mean, my, my favorite way of doing this is with these carts. And, and Al, from Lecture Demo, who sets all this stuff up for us, uh, has tried to get these carts aligned as well as possible. They're always a little problematic whether I can make it across the room without crashing into things. So here's the story. Right now, my momentum is zero. It turns out you can, you can calculate my momentum pretty easily from just two other physical quantities, my mass and my velocity. Remember, velocity's got direction to it. So, it's, so if you, mass doesn't, but velocity does, the product of those two is, is, is itself has a direction. 
the same direction as velocity brought into the story. So I'm going to start here at velocity equals zero, which is the same, which means that I have no momentum. Mass I've got, velocity I've got zero, that's nothing, so we've got no momentum. I can't get moving without help. Something to get me moving to, so that I have momentum, I need to get momentum from something else. I'm going to get it from the wall. And that means I'm going to push on the wall. We'll talk in a minute about how you, how you exchange momentum. But I'm going to get the wall, I'm going to push the wall to your left, and the wall is going to push me to, to your right, and we're going to exchange some momentum. It's going to end up with momentum the wrong way, left, leftward, and you're not going to see that because it's so big. It's, it, it's, and it's attached to the whole earth. So I'm going to take some momentum to the right from it, it will end up with a deficit of rightward momentum, which is the same as leftward momentum. It'll have it, but you won't see much because it's too big. But I'll have it. So here we go. I'm going to get some out of, the, out of the wall. Ready? There we go. I've got rightward momentum now. And I can't stop because I can't give it away. In order to stop, I have to give it to something. I'm losing a little bit of friction. There, I gave it to the wall. So come back here. <laughs> go away. I gave it some away momentum. Um, yeah. It was just a physics experiment, honest officer. I didn't really mean to assault that person. OK. Yeah. <laughs> At this point in life, who cares? I can do silly stuff. Um, so I, I'm going to get some leftward momentum out of the wall now. Ready? Here it goes. All right, I'm carrying it with me. I can't stop. I just can't, you know, until I give it to something, I can't stop. I'm losing a little bit of friction. I'm going to clear that. Ah, I did. So good, so good. Whoa. And now I'll give it to the wall. All right? The point is, back on day one, we, we noticed that skaters who are, who are moving tend to keep moving in a straight line at a steady pace. And that was the magic of inertia. Or the, no, not magic, of course, because it's... This is not a magic class, this is a physics class, and there's a reason behind all of these things. The real reason behind inertia is conservation of momentum. That's why inertia, this, this behavior we see, calling it inertia, that's why it's there. It's because objects that are left to themselves, free of external influences, which we now know are forces, move at constant velocity. Why do they do that? Because if they're free of forces, they can't exchange momentum with anything. Whatever they've got, they've got. It's stuck. And since they can't change their mass, and since their momentum is their mass times their velocity, their momentum is stuck. Their mass is fixed. Their velocity has to be stuck, too. They can't change their velocity. So that's why things move with constant velocity when you leave them alone, because they have mom whatever momentum they have, they have, and they can't change it. Is it okay? Your questions about that idea? That's the real secret underneath uh, inertia. The secret, I'll tell you, the secret underneath conservation of momentum, you know, look even deeper under the lid, is the uniformity of space. And so this is a little aside for the, you know, if you ever wanted to know, hey, for the experts, okay? It's because the physics here is the same as the physics here. And that uniformity of space, everything's the same, uh, leads to a conservation law, the conservation of momentum. Um, it's a, it's, it comes out of mathematical physics, and it was, in, it was uh, discovered by Emmy Noether. So, so there, there were, even, even in a chauvinistic, male-dominated environment of physics and math of, of 100-plus years ago, there were some, some significant contributions by women. So she discovered that any time there's, a, there's a, a, a continuous symmetry in nature, that, that things are the same across an, a swath, you end up with a, with a conserved quantity. This, in this case, it's momentum. In the case where the physics now is the same as the physics now, is the same as the physics now, that, 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 that physics is uniform through time. That leads to another conservation. A conserved quantity, energy. That's why energy is conserved, because physics isn't changing with time. And there's a third one that we'll come up to shortly, 
which is the physics facing you is the same as the physics facing to the right, is the same as the physics away from you, and so on. That continuous, the symmetry of, of physics in direction gives you another conserved quantity, angular momentum. Okay, so this is more for the philosophers among you trying to wonder, like, why should this be such? These are these continuous uniformities of, of space and time that give rise to conserved quantities. All right, experts, you can, you know, ba back to normal. All right, so, so momentum is a conserved quantity. It carries you along once you've got it. Uh, be a, you know, do, do, do remember that it's got a direction to it. Um, and now let's look at how do you, how do you pass it along? So, so if, it, it, my, you know, my claim is that, 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 you, that you carry it with you, but, but you can change it by, by giving it to something else, how do you give it to something else? I, I was clearly doing it somehow uh, by pushing on the wall and having the wall push back. What are the details? Well, the, the details in this are that you convey momentum to something, not by way of work. Work is, is the, pass, the passing along of energy, wrong conserved quantity. To pass along momentum, you do an impulse. And it's, a, it's always an awkward, it's an awkward name. You know, to do work rolls off my tongue easily. To do impulse or do an impulse is more awkward in my mind, but, but that's what you do. You do an impulse on something, and in that process, you give the other thing momentum. Um, because momentum itself has a direction, it's a vector quantity, impulse itself has to be a vector quantity. You, you, not only do you give somebody momentum, but you give it with, a, with a, direct, a particular direction. And okay, having led into this for, for too long, an impulse is the force you exert on something times the time over which you exert that force. So there's no distance involved in this. It's a force times a time. So to give an impulse, and I'll just pick something to push on here. I can give momentum to this ball by exerting a force on it for a certain amount of time. I'm going I'm to give it momentum to the left. It's attached to the string, so it's going to come back at me. Um, I'll duck, right? Uh, I'll, I'll catch it and I'll run into the end zone. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so I, I, I gave it leftward momentum. I'm giving it a force. I exert, you know, I exert a force on it for a period of time, push for a second, and off it went. Okay? If I pick something that will actually go somewhere. Move everybody. Okay. This is more, uh, probably a better choice. No momentum right now. Mass, it's got mass. No velocity, okay, so it's got no momentum. To, to give it some momentum, I push it to the left for time, and now it's got leftward momentum. I take the momentum back out by, by pulling it to the right for time. So that's the passage of momentum along. Impulse, so how hard do you push, how long, how long you, uh, you push for. Is that okay so far? So, that means that when two bumper cars, just imagine you got one bumper car just sitting there, motionless in the middle of the rink, the person hasn't yet figured out how to press the pedal, just sitting there, and you chuckle, 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 come roaring up, bonk, you hit the bumper car. In the process of, of, of hitting, you're passing along momentum. You, you had some to start with. You push on the other bumper car, through the bumpers, a uh, certain force for a certain amount of time, and off goes the, 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 the second bumper car, moving along, having acquired some of your original momentum, in this case, toward the left. All right? Why the bumpers? Why are there rubber bumpers as opposed to just hard steel? Turns out the hard steel would work, would work just fine for the passage of a momentum, but it wouldn't be very fun for the riders because the movement of momentum from, say, from you to the other people would be too fast. Very short period of time. If you, if you, if you get rid of the rubber and, and just put steel there, it's now, instead of being boing, it's boing. Big force, little time. It's the same impulse. You can pass the same amount of momentum along to the second bumper car with different combinations of force and time. 
All that matters is the product of the two. So with the rubber, the force is little, the time is long. Alternative, the alternative is this, with steel bumpers, the time's going to be short, so what's, the force has to be big to compensate. So it's a huge force, little time. Very uncomfortable for all people involved. Um, my public service announcement version of this. You, you okay with that idea? The, the, the momentum transfers, I mean, this, this is everywhere. So, so yeah, I'm doing this in the context of, of bumper cars. But this is the reason why you don't like to walk into hard, stiff things when you, when you bang into them. Because you transfer momentum to them, and you do it too quickly by way of a large force that hurts you. Um, this is why we have modern cars have airbags come, to come up. In slowing from 60 miles an hour to zero uh, by, by encountering the steering wheel of the car is no fun or worse. It involves all, giving away all your momentum to the steering wheel in too short a period of time. What's the alternative? Put something big and squishy in front of the steering wheel so that you prolong the transfer of momentum. If, if, if you know, I, and here's another uh, case where I don't want to step on people's uh, personal experiences, so I'll, I'll try to be diplomatic about the whole thing, but, but tell me if I, if I say something that, that, that you find uh, disturbing. But when a car, it hits something that's not going to move, uh, the tree. It's going to stop. All of its momentum is going to go into the tree. And the riders are all going to have to lose their momentum as well. They want to do it as slowly as possible because if it's transferred rapidly, it involves two big forces, painfully big forces. So everything soft and squishy is good. Uh, you slow down gently. Same thing with you, a high jumper, when you go over the bar and come down, you don't want to lose all your downward momentum suddenly into the, into the ground or into uh, some, something, something hard. You want to lose it gently, slow, sorry, slowly by encountering something that's soft and yielding and, and lowers you gradually toward the ground. Um, is it okay? Is, Watch the world around you and, and things that you don't like to bump into. You will see that you go, I mean, I figure we sort of go through life trying to transfer momentum as slowly as possible. Never fast. Well, I mean, there are cases where it's okay, but it's, by and large, you want to avoid the fast transfers. <clears throat> and, uh, an example is a public service announcement. Uh, a, a league baseball, approximately, you know, official league, except probably it isn't. Um, and a soft, a softer, reduced impact force or, or softer, soft strike uh, ball. They differ in only a single sort of subtle way. They both have the same mass, they feel pretty much the same, but one has more surface hardness than the other. The league ball is, is, is hard like a rock, all the way, you know, right there to the surface. Whereas the soft strike ball has got a little bit of squish to it. It's a little bit of giving during the impact. And so this one, when it hits something, will transfer all of its momentum you know, in a thousandth of a second or something like that, whereas this one will transfer it in a hundredth of a second, prolonging the, the impact by, by a factor of 10. And the result is a big difference in the force. This one exerts peak force that's 10 times as big as this one. These things hurt. And you know, I used to have a photograph of a friend's uh, a, a, a child I knew who is now married and grown up, um, not necessarily in that order. Um, he got his brother, the pitcher, hit him square in the eye with a with a basically a league baseball, and it, wah, he was just a, a dramatic mess for a couple of weeks. Uh, recovered completely, thank goodness. But these things are nasty. Be careful setting children to play with them. That is right, you know, is ever, all the parents, the, the, the super enthusiastic parents, my son has to play with the league ball, otherwise he'll never grow up to be a major league player. Yeah, here's the, here's the comparison. This, so this is a league ball, a nail and wood. I can pound in a nail. It's, it's not that different from using a hammer. It is basically a hammer, okay? How, you know, how does a hammer work? 
a hammer, you, you invest downward momentum into the head of the hammer. You have that, that head of that hammer encounter the nail. The two of them go, uh-oh, we're going to hit each other. We're both very hard and unyielding. We're going to transfer momentum mighty fast. And then the hammer invests all of its downward momentum into the nail in a 10,000th of a second or something like that by way of a tremendous force. And that tremendous force has the consequence of pushing the nail into the wood. So, so when you hit someone with a league ball, you're, you're, you might, might as well just throw a hammer at them, okay? It's the same thing. This, on the other hand, is no big deal. In fact, you know, not super comfortable, but it's, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it, you know, it's, it's tolerable. Huge difference. So if, if, I, if I have prevented future injuries, you know, or, or mitigated future injuries, I've, I've done something good today. All right? Any questions about momentum transferring type stuff? Remember, remember that it's, there's direction involved in that too. Um, I think I am now have, have given you enough information or, or presented enough to, to, to go back to a story I told you. I've, I've told you today again, but I'm going to do it one more time. And that is, I'm going to to bounce off the wall as though I were a, a rubber, you know, bouncy ball. When I do that, watch the momentum transfer. So here I'm coming along, I'm going to get some momentum out of the floor. I got some, I'm, it's to the right, I'm going to give all my momentum to the, to the wall and I, I, I rebound. You know, what was involved in that? Well, suppose I started by acquiring 10 units of rightward momentum. I go up to the wall and in slow motion, I transfer all 10 units of rightward momentum to the wall. I'm down to zero. It's all there in the wall. If the wall weren't so big and massive, if it were something, I don't know, a, a bicyclist, they would be, begin to, be, to, to move to the right, having been given rightward momentum by me. I've given all 10 units to the wall. And now I'll continue to give 10 units, 10 more units of rightward momentum to the wall. I do that by, by pushing longer. And as I do that, I end up running a deficit of rightward momentum. I now have negative 10 units of rightward momentum, which is 10 units of leftward momentum. So that's what happens during a bounce, end of a story. When, when, a, when an object, a ball, bounces off the wall, it gives more momentum to the wall in the direction it was traveling than it had. It ends up running a ne you know, deficit. Ne it runs negative. And it rebounds because it's coming back with its deficit is, is momentum in the other direction. OK? Uh, this, you know, I, in my questions on ex old exams or, or stories I talk about or I ask about, this means that if you want to transfer as much momentum to something by hitting it with, I don't know, a, a bouncy ball or, or, or any object, you actually will transfer more momentum to something and knock it more, more intensely by throwing something that bounces. It actually comes back at you uh, because there's, you transfer all the momentum in coming to a stop, and that's what a bean bag does. It, it hits, comes to a stop, it's out of momentum, zero. A bouncy ball goes, hits, goes to zero, and then goes negative and comes back, and it actually makes for a bigger transfer. So battering rams. When you go to the park and you're trying to, uh, amusement park or, or fair, and you're trying to win one of the big stuffed animals again, um, they often will give you balls that, are, that, are, that don't bounce well to knock over the milk jugs or something like that. Because if they give you things that bounce well, you, it's easier to knock them over. So the games, again, are, are rigged to make life difficult for you. Bouncy balls are the best projectile. Have it come back at you. Transfers more momentum in the process. All right? In bumper cars, then, you get these transfers of momentum. Just to illustrate this, keep the time under control here a little bit. Um, you know, rather than having a bumper car ring, I can have a, a little air hockey ring. So here's you. Here's your friend. Your friend's just sitting there. Where's the forward button, right? Okay, and you come along and you smack them. If, if, if you and your friend and your cars are arranged so you have exactly the same mass, it is possible for you to come to a complete stop and your friend to, con to, to, to continue moving. 
And that, that was a pretty good version. What I'm trying to illustrate, I'll show, you, I'll show you by hand and then I'll try to do it one more time, is you can have it so you're, you're carrying along 10 units of momentum to the right. You hit your friend, bonk, and they go off carrying 10 units of momentum to the right, and you've got none left. The transfer, it can be arranged so the transfers are essentially perfect. Not quite. Well, I got it. It's the alignment that's there. That went, you know, it, it all came out. You lost all your momentum giving every bit of it to, the, to your friend. And you've seen collisions like this. And they're toys that, that do this sort of collision. Uh, this perfect transfer of momentum from one, one to the other works only when you have the same mass because at the same time you're transferring momentum, you're also transferring energy. And if the masses are different, you can't get a complete transfer of momentum and a complete transfer of energy. They, the, those two things fight each other and you get partial transfers or strange things in between. Uh, the, the big one, try and transfer, is that guy moving? Yeah. The big guy, it doesn't, it doesn't, it shouldn't come to a complete stop. All that, something's odd about that guy. Okay, here. Big red, little red. No, big green, little red. That, that's what I wanted to have, have happen. When a big one hits a little one, the big one can't completely stop. It can't give all of its momentum to the little one. That involves some, that, that would end up creating energy out of nowhere or getting rid of energy. I have to think about it. It doesn't, it doesn't conserve both quantities properly. So the big one keeps going to, to some extent. And the worse the, match, the, the, the mismatch in mass, the more the big one keeps going. Uh, an example of this is when your car encounters bugs at 60 miles an hour, there's the bug, there's your car. Your car does not stop. It does not give all its momentum to the bug. Wouldn't conserve energy properly. So instead, it swats the bug forward. Bad for the bug. Car keeps going. You go to the car wash. Um, oh, the other possibility is little thing hits big thing. The little thing bounces back. Again, it's a problem. It can't, it can't give all its, no. it ends up, actually, it ends up giving more than its original momentum to the, to the, big, the big thing and ends up with a deficit. It bounces back to some extent. So all these bumper car experiences are related to how much mass do you have. And if you both have the same mass, you can essentially transfer your motion perfectly. I'll unplug this. Any thoughts or questions? All right. Keep looking at the clock. I want to cover. Oh, this is, I, this, I just did this. The, the mallets smacking each other. Um, avoid hard projectiles. Okay. Spinning cars. When, it, when a car is, I told, told you already that when a car is moving along, touching nothing, is it carrying force with it? No. It's carrying momentum with it. The force is involved in the start and finish in the transfer process, it's involved in the impulse. It's not carried. There's the same story applies to angular momentum. There is a conserved quantity of rotation. And when you're spinning, whoa, you're carrying something with you. You're not carrying torque. You're not carrying a twist with you. Instead, you're carrying a conserved quantity known as angular momentum. I'll stop. Um, once you're spinning, and if you're free of any uh, ways of, if you're free of torques, so you cannot exchange angular momentum with anything else, once you got it, you got it, you got to keep spinning. Now you're stuck. And to get rid of it, you have to exert a torque on something. So the wheelie carts freed me up, uh, made it possible for me to move without exchanging momentum very much with the floor. In the same, it only works along one direction, of course. The wheelie carts aren't, aren't free range. Don't, don't turn me into a free range chicken. Um, this swivel chair will free me up so that I can't exchange angular momentum about a vertical axis. I'm on the swivel car, swivel, swivel chair. Once I'm on it, my feet are off the floor, so I can't get any torques about a vertical axis. I'm pretty much unable to start spinning or to stop spinning. I, I'm making a little progress here because something's a little out of balance. Not quite perfect. Okay. But the basic idea is there, that when you're on a swivel chair, if, you're, if you've got no angular momentum, you can't get any. Well, however, if I do have angular momentum, 
I carry it with me. So ready, get set. I'm getting some out of the floor, and now I've got it, and I can't stop until I give it away. And <laughs> I'm going to stop. Okay. Whoa. All right. Stop moving. So same idea. You get angular momentum out of the floor, for example, or out of something else by way of a torque. And the next slide will talk about the, 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 the transfer of angular momentum, this conserved quantity, goes by way of, of an angular impulse, which is a torque <laughs> for time. This is a, a normal impulse, is force for time, an angular impulse is torque for time. Somebody twists you times the time over which they twist you, that's how much angular momentum they give you. It's got a direction too. This angular momentum like this, force, which is truly upward, is different from angular momentum like this, which is downward, according to the right-hand rule. Uh, to go from one to the other, I have to make a, a very large exchange of, of angular momentum. You okay with the idea? Well, to, to show you exchanges of angular momentum, I'm going to get this thing chock full of angular momentum in, one, in a particular direction. And then I'm going to sit on the swivel chair and the two of us, as a team, decoupled from the rest of the world, are going to exchange angular momentum between us. So let me get this started. I like the sound of this one. We have another wheel. It doesn't, it's not quite as. Ramming speed! Okay, we'll call that good enough. Right now, it's got no angular momentum vertically at all. It's slowing down fast, which is irritating. If I turn it so its angular momentum now is upward, my angular momentum is now downward. Back to zero. Between the two of us, we have no vertical angular momentum. But we can redistribute it. Do, do, yeah, I, this is, I, it has upward angular momentum now, and I have downward angular momentum. It has downward angular momentum, and I have upward angular momentum. But between the two of us, we have no vertical angular momentum at all. It's just traded back and forth. Is that okay? Incidentally, you wonder how satellites orient themselves in space? They've got nothing around to push on them. They've got little wheels in them. They can do this. It's losing all its spin. It's got terrible bearings. Disappointment city. All right? Um, but, but quite seriously, satellites, if, if, if you want to, you know, you've been looking at that star over there, you want to look at this star over here, how do you get there? You have a little wheel, and you, and you twist it back and forth like this, and, it, and the satellite rotates. The thing I want to make sure you, 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 you can take away is that the two of us together had no angular momentum vertically, and we could exchange it. We exchange it by way of torques for time. That's the angular impulse. And you can't see the torque for time because, of course, you, you, don't, you can't see torque. But I can feel it. It's twisting hard on me, and I'm twisting hard on it. We actually really are doing this whole exchange process of angular momentum. Uh, after class, any of you who want to stick around to, to play this, you can feel the torque going back and forth. I might go get the other wheel because it's a better, you know, it spins for a decent amount of time. That guy runs out of juice quickly. But you, you okay with the idea that the angular momentum moves between things uh, by way of torques for time? And that's, that happens with the, with the bumper cars as they're hitting each other and bouncing around. They're, they're, they're twisting each other and they're exerting, doing angular impulses on one another to exchange their rotational motion. Um, one more thing to, to, to show you related to, to rotation. Rotational mass, remember, ordinary, ordinary momentum gives rise to this, this concept of, of inertia and Newton's first law of motion, that an object that's free of external forces has to move at constant velocity. Why? Because momentum is conserved and because mass can't change. And since momentum is mass times velocity, if you've got fixed momentum because you're not touching anything, your mass can't change, so your velocity can't change. So you have to keep moving at the same rate. That story isn't the same with rotation. With rotation, 
your angular momentum, it turns out, and I didn't point this out at the time. I'll flip back to it for one second. Your angular momentum down here at the bottom is your rotational mass times your angular velocity. So if you've got a fixed angular momentum, you're on the swivel chair, for example, so you can't change your angular momentum, at least vertically, then the product of your rotational mass times your angular velocity is also fixed. It's, it's your angular momentum. But if you change your shape, you can change your rotational mass. Consequently, your angular velocity has to, cha has to change to compensate. If your rotational mass increases, your angular velocity has to decrease, so the product of the two doesn't change. It's the product of the two, that is your angular momentum, that, that's fixed, not the individual pieces. So to illustrate that one, this is this, the skater trick. If I get myself moving, rota rotating, so I, I, I get some angular momentum out of the ground, while my rotational mass is big, because I've got these dumbbells out far, all my exercise for today. So now I've got angular momentum. The product of my ro uh, rotational mass times my angular velocity can't change. But if I shrink the rotational mass piece of that, the angular velocity piece goes up. Okay? For a while, I'll fall over here. Ah. For science, things I do for science. So that, that's the skater trick. This, this idea that, that if a skater starts with his arms out wide, you make, basically make his rotational mass as big as he can, start spinning, and then shrink his rotational mass by pulling all the pieces of actual mass in as close to the pivot as possible, his rotational velocity has to increase to compensate so as to keep his angular momentum constant. All right, so these sorts of things, the, the, yeah, you'll, you'll see them. All, all this mechanical stuff actually is gonna show up in the Olympics, <laughs> left, right, and center. Uh, all the downhill sports involve ramps and accelerations down ramps. So lots, to, lots to, to think about there. Anyway, see you guys on Wednesday. Remember, problem set two is due then. <laughs>